Pokeri on miesvaltainen laji. Arviota 95 prosenttia pelaajista on miehiä. Mutta mistä tämä massiivinen ero johtuu? Onko pokerissa jotain, miksi naiset eivät pärjää siinä yhtä hyvin? Ei tietenkään ole. Kaikilla on tässä pelissä yhtävät mahdollisuudet pärjätä, mutta valitettavasti me miehet emme ole tehneet tästä naisille kauhean helppoa. Pokeriyhteisössä puhutaan paljon siitä, miten saataisiin houkuteltua enemmän naisia lain pariin. Mutta ensin meidän pitäisi tehdä enemmän sen eteen, että naiset tuntisivat itsensä tervetulleeksi pokeripöytiin. Miehet pitävät kyllä ääntä, mutta mitä jos kunnataisiin kerrankin naisia? I started my poker career in the early 70s. Back then, as soon as I turned 21, I decided I was going to go to Las Vegas and play blackjack. And my father, who was a very good poker player, said, Linda, if you're going to gamble, you need have to learn how to play poker because you're not playing against the house. So back then, I was working at the post office. In the early 70s, there weren't many poker books, not like today. And so I went and got a book and I taught myself how to play from the book. And from the beginning, I loved poker. It was my niche. I always say, you have to be good at something. Well, I'm not creative, I'm not artistic, I, you know, I'm not singer, not theater, but poker was my thing. And so I started playing with the guys at work. They originally were welcoming me into the game, but once uh, a few weeks went by and I was picking it up, then they didn't want me to play anymore. So I was living in Southern California at the time, and uh, there was a place called Gardena, and it had legalized poker. Only two games were legal. Back then there was no Texas Hold'em at all. It was all draw poker. So I started going there, and then on my weekends, I started going to Las Vegas. The first poker tournament I ever played in Las Vegas was at the Las Vegas Club. And when I walked up to register, the card room manager was so excited because I don't think they ever had a woman register before. And he was like, oh, honey, if you win, we're going to give you free buy-ins and this and that. Well, things went along. And as I got to the final table, all of a sudden I noticed it was nine men against me. And then on our break, I saw them all talking. Obviously, they were talking about how to get rid of me. So it was not a welcoming atmosphere back then. I went on to win the poker tournament and uh, that was the first of many wins. And I drive home after playing all night and the sun's coming up and I was like, how lucky can I be to be in the world of poker? And in 1980, I decided, you know what? I'm going to enter the World Series of Poker. Very first time for me. And I decided ahead of time that if I did well, I would move to Las Vegas. At the time I was a level 17 in the post office had a great career ahead of me. I was first up to be a postmaster in my region. And I just said, you know what? I can do this. Poker's my thing and I can do it. So I came in fifth that year. Back in 1980, they only paid three places. Not like today where they pay 10 to 15% of the field. And I came in fifth, just short of the money, but that gave me the courage to go back and give my notice. And I did that. And then two weeks later, I moved to Las Vegas to begin my career as a professional poker player. When I first started playing in Vegas in the late 70s, and when I moved here in 1980, there were very few poker rooms in town. Uh, the Golden Nugget was the biggest one and Stardust, and uh, it was different back then. It was very rough for women. It was hard to be a woman. You had to have very thick skin because there were a lot of men who said, you shouldn't be here, you should be home in the kitchen. That's completely different from today's poker, but uh, back then, I, you know, I, I had to give it back to them. Otherwise, they would have just picked on me mercilessly. I started to learn chess before I even knew how to read. So there are photographs of me playing against my brother when I was two years old and he was four years old. Um, now I think I might have been hamming it up for the camera a little bit. I'm not sure if I knew how all the pieces moved, but I did learn at a very young age from my father. Um, my brother was one of the most talented young chess players in the entire country. And my father is also a chess master. So I actually felt a bit intimidated. Like I wasn't as talented immediately. My learning curve was a little slow. And I remember thinking that sometimes people were like saying behind my back or occasionally to my face, like, why are you so weak when your family is chess masters and you get to go to all these places? So I guess I felt like a little bit in my head. It all started to change when I was in high school or 
just around that, you know, transition from middle school to high school, I started to, first of all, fall in love with the game itself. That was like the big turning point for me. In The Queen's Gambit, Beth Harmon famously says that chess is not just about winning, it's also beautiful. And me, I, I really think that I take an artistic approach to everything I do. So once that clicked for me, um, and I stopped thinking about results, started thinking about the process, that's when I began to shut up. The experience in a male-dominated industry traveling around the world in chess, I think was pretty positive for me once I became very strong and gifted and talented or considered gifted and talented. Um, I, because I think people were like really excited that I was there. And then also I had my father who was chess champion and always like one of the most popular parents and my brother. So I had this kind of structure where I think the idea that I was talented combined with having my family um, that were so supportive made me a little bit less um, exposed to the sexism that so many women face. Um, and that's what I think is so important. The most successful women in games, sometimes we aren't the ones who are um, harassed or underestimated as much, right? Sometimes we have really positive experiences. We always have to remember what it was like when you first started, because that is what we need to attack to get more girls and women into the game. I loved poker when my brother first introduced it to me. He was actually one of the very early players on Poker Stars. So um, he showed me, at the time I was actually writing my first book and I had just graduated NYU. He was saying, Jen, you gotta play poker. It's like free money for smart people. And, and my mom said the same exact thing. It's funny because so many other poker players that we were friends with, their parents were like, you know, don't do poker, go to law school, do this, do that. And my mom was like, Jen, why are you the only one in the family that's not playing poker? So eventually I did, I did give it a try. And I loved it. I loved playing online. I played a lot of sitting goes to start off. And uh, one big thing was when Poker Stars started doing these satellites to women's events, that was big for me because those were easier to qualify um, because the buy-in levels were like more approachable. Um, so then I actually got to go to places like Monte Carlo and Madrid and Bahamas. And then I started getting even more motivated to just get better. Because there were so few women back then, the women in the poker room kind of cling to each other and became friends. Uh, my best friend still today, after 40 years of friendship, is Jan Fisher. Barbara Enright was playing and we became friends, Marsha Wagner, and we're still friends today. So I think that women in poker uh, get along really well. My first WSOP was the ladies event. Since then, I've played in a lot more, obviously, but back then, it really was a very small community and everybody knew everybody and people were uh, not, maybe not as competitive as they are now. Today, it's, it, you know, it's a lot more cutthroat, which sports should be, you've got to try to win. But back then, uh, players, once they were knocked out, were rooting for other players. And, um, you know, we all got to be friends and it was, it was a very nice community. We traveled together and um, got to know each other. Uh, once, once I realized uh, that I was not going to let them uh, put me down for being a woman and I started fighting back, then I became accepted and became one of the guys. And I had lots of male friends. Uh, Mike Sexton was a good friend back then. Traveling with him was awesome. You know, I was part of the WPT family for the first six years and we would travel everywhere and uh, Mike became very famous quickly and we'd be in an airport and somebody would come up and ask him for an autograph and no matter what he was doing, he would stop it and he would look that person in the eye and he would say, thank you for asking and make you feel like you were the only person on the world, which is not like all poker celebrities or all celebrities, period, but he was so good at being a people person and it was genuine. There have always been a lot of men who are very sympathetic to the situation that women have to face. Back when I started playing, 
I, occasionally some of them would speak up if somebody was out of line with me. And I think it's more common today that men do speak up, but still a lot of them don't realize that um, women have to take a lot of uh, abuse at the table. Little comments that they don't think are bad, they, they are. They, you know, people, men especially, make some comments thinking that they're being cute, but it's not cute. And so they just don't realize what it's like to... Uh, have to deal with these kinds of things every time you sit down at the table. No niin, Linda. Saat nähdä pokeri maailmaa pöydän molemmin puolin sekä jakajana että pelaajana hyvin miesvaltaisessa lajissa, niin näin naisnäkökulmasta millaisia epäkohtia saat törmännyt? Kerran kun olin rock-teemaisessa pokeriturnauksessa jakamassa ja sinne piti pukeutua rock-henkisesti meidän jakajien, niin mulla oli toppi päällä, mikä oli ihan siveellinen toppi omasta mielestäni, niin tällöin eräs kollegani sanoi, että hei hei hei, että käypäs vaihtamassa toi paita, että siellä on paljon miehiä pelaamassa ja jos sä jaat pokeria ja sulla on toppi päällä ja näkyy vähän kaulaa ja kädet, niin he ei näe sinua pokerin jakajana, vaan he näkevät sinut naisena jolloin he eivät välttämättä kunnioita sun päätöksiä siinä pokeripöydässä. No sitten kun sä vaihdoit taas jakajasta pelaajaksi, niin miten ne kokemukset sitten muuttuu? Melkein aina tulee joku kommentti, että oho, että nainen tuli pelaamaan tänne. Ja viimeksi kun olin esimerkiksi Helsingin kasinalla pelaamassa, niin tuli kommentti, että no niin, nyt mun onni kääntyi. Ja tätä kuulee tosi paljon, että tulee semmoinen vähän esineellistetty olo, vaikka ei sitä kauhean moni tai välttämättä kukaan pahalla tarkoita, mutta tulee semmoinen olo, että onko mä joku sun lucky charm, että heti kun mä tuun pöytään, niin sulle tulee parempia kortteja, koska mä tuon tälle vieraalle miehelle heti onnea tässä pöydässä. Ulkonäön kommentointia, mitä kauhean moni mies taas ei varmasti joudu itse kokeen, että jos on vaikka mekko päällä ja panostusta, niin Silloin tulee melkein aina jotain kommentteja, varsinkin humalaisilta miehiltä. Sen takia itse olen varsinkin Suomessa pelatessani mennyt yleensä pokeripöytään college-huppari päällä ja ilman meikkiä ja harvemmin sille, että on hirveästi laitettu, koska ei halua kuulla niitä kommentteja. Aika usein tulee myös kyselyitä, että missä sun poikaystävä on, jos sä oot jossain pokeripaikassa tai kasinolla ja esimerkiksi Tuolla Vegasissa, missä aika paljon on sattunut kaikenlaista enemmän kuin Suomessa, niin siellä eräs mies kyseli, että olenko pokerjonossa ja missä minun poikaystäväni on. Ja minä sitten valehtelin hänelle, että hän on tässä samassa huoneessa pelaamassa turnausta. Ja hän sitten alkoi levittelemään hartioitaan ja kyselemään, että onko sun poikaystävä isompi kuin minä. Ja vastasin sitten, että on. Yksi kerta, mikä tuli mieleen, oli täällä Suomessa, kun eräs mies, joka on niin kuin pelannut mukaan samoja pelejä paljon, niin Hänellä oli auto parkkihallissa, mikä oli tämmöinen ihan täysin pimeä parkkihalli keskellä yötä, tyhjä, että siellä ei muita autoja ole, niin hän heitti, että hei Linda, tuu tonne mun autolle, että siellä on, mulla on sulle noita tuollaisia herkkuja, että tuu tonne käymään. Ja sitten mä olin, että en mä vittynyt sanoa, että luuleeko että mä lähden sun kanssa tonne pimeäseen parkkihallin katsoa jotain, jotain sun hedelmiä, että miksi et sä voit tuoda niitä tänne. Että tuommoista vähän ahdistavia kokemuksia, vaikka ei siinä välttämättä mitään pahaa olla tarkoitettukaan. Näin miehenä, niin mä en esimerkiksi itse varmasti edes pysty tajumaan, että miten paljon kaikkea tuollaista. Naiset kohtaatte siellä pöydissä. Ja tietenkin ahdistelu ja tämmöinen, niin se ei todellakaan ok, se on itsestään selvää. Mutta onko sitten ehkä jotain juttuja, mitkä ei ole ok, mitä miehet ei sitten välttämättä edes tajuita? Pelillisesti tulee aika paljon vastaan tällaisia asioita, mitä miehet ei välttämättä tajua, että se ei ole ok. Esimerkiksi sellaista, että pelataan paljon pehmeämmin naista vastaan että softplayta tulee jonkin verran kohdattua, koska he eivät halua viedä naisen rahoja. Ja tätä myös sanotaan, että ei vaikka lyödä riverillä ja sanotaan, että en mä halua sun rahoja viedä. Ja sit sieltä checkpackataan nutsit ja maksetaan huonoilla sen takia, että halutaan antaa mulle ns. lahja. Ja itse en välttämättä sellaista lahjaa haluaisi, että en haluaisi ottaa vaikka 100 euroa käteistä siinä kasinon aulassa. Vaikka tältä mieheltä, joka on vaikka pokeripöydässä, saattaisi maksaa lahjana tämän. Moni nainen, jotka menee pokeripöytään pelaamaan, niin kuin monet miehetkin, niin haluavat mennä sinne sen takia, että he haluavat pelata sitä pokeria ja kilpailla siinä toisiaan vastaan. Ja 
tehdä sitä hyvää tulosta tai tehdä hyviä muuveja ja saada ne kiksit siitä, että jes, mä pelasin hyvin, eikä että jes, mulle lahjutettiin rahaa sen takia, että olen nainen ja mua säälitään. One thing I think that guys are starting to catch on, but I'd like it to be more widely known, is this concept of you're not like other girls. I hate that, and I see that a lot in poker and chess, that they, you know, they pick one woman who they think is like cool and aggressive and strong, and it's just like, well, why can't you all be like Beth Harmon? Why can't everybody just be like Beth Harmon, who is the, the, the hero of the Queen's Gambit? Um, but the reality is that Women come from all different backgrounds, and a lot of them have encountered a lot more resistance on their path, don't have support structures, and some of them don't have the, the talent. We can't expect every woman to be like hyper-talented like Vanessa Selps. If you are talented, you're like a goddess, and if you're not, you're garbage, right? I think there's that kind of like um, oscillation that we put such a spotlight in women in the game which can be great, but it's a way in which their mistakes get magnified. And yes, the other side of that is if their successes also get magnified, but we need to figure out how to um, make sure that people, people of all different personality types and talent levels can kind of stay in the game until they find their joy um, from poker. Because I think that poker has something to teach everyone. And sometimes it'll teach it to you very early on. And like the, the year or two that you spend in poker will be a way to learn about finances and yourself, and then you'll go on to the next thing. And some people have a much longer journey in poker. I think there are a lot of differences between the sexism in poker and chess. Um, in chess, you know, we have a lot of kids. So it's very like youth oriented, um, which means that there's a lot of like advocacy and education experts who are trying to like close the gender gap. But uh, I'd say that in poker, the sexism is often kind of like connected to the casino environment. I'd say the worst sexism and misogyny I've had in the poker world is actually from having to like walk through a casino late at night um, to the poker tournament or back from the poker tournament. So it's actually like not even the poker itself in those cases, uh, it's like adjacent. Those are the big differences that it's like in poker, it's an adult population and there's a lot of money at stake. Um, one thing that you have in poker that you don't have in chess is just the wealth disparity and the income disparity between women and men clearly creates a different effect where um, people are always asking, why don't women play more high roller tournaments? Well, it's, it's not that shocking. They have less money. They might make less money per hour and they also have less wealth. So how would they you know, possibly play as many high rollers as men. On top of that, they also tend to have more responsibilities for children, for elders, and um, usually have more pressure to be like um, uh, emotionally available to all the people in their lives. So I think it's quite understandable why there would be fewer women um, playing high stakes poker. A lot of people point out that women don't take as many risks as men. And I do agree with that. But I also think that it's not because of like any kind of like natural tendency towards less risk aversion. I think it's because women are often punished more when we take a risk and we fail. Punished both by people saying like, oh, that was stupid, but also punished just by life because especially in the country that I'm from, the United States, there's um, inadequate like childcare, healthcare, abortion rights, all of these things for women are really inadequate in the United States right now. And so there's just a greater risk premium on anything that you do. So yet that can go too far. If you don't take enough risks in life, um, your chances for success are so, so much lower. So I think poker teaches you that because, of course, if you start out and you take too many risks, you lose all your money very quickly. But you also learn in poker that if you don't take enough risks, you'll lose all your money very slowly. Poker has definitely taught me a lot about life and my own risk aversion and just that if my bluffs aren't getting called, it doesn't mean that I'm a great bluffer, but that I might not be bluffing enough. <laughs> and exactly the same in life. If you're never being told that you're asking for too much or you're never being told no about the things that you want to do, it's not just because you're a great negotiator. It might mean that you have to be even more aggressive.
Live-peleissähän riidien ottaminen on aika tärkeää ja kun uusi pelaaja tulee pöytään, niin myöskin alitajuisesti hänestä muodostetaan tietynlainen kuva. Ja naispelaajia usein pidetäänkin tiukempina pelaajina ja että he eivät uskalla ottaa niin paljon riskejä, jolloin naisia myös bluffataan enemmän, koska ajatellaan, että he eivät uskalla maksaa, ellei heillä ole tosi hyvä käsi. Ja usein naispelaajat voi sitten ottaakin vähän löysempiä maksuja vaikka Riverillä, että sitä voi sitten hyödyntää, että tiedetään, että heitä bluffataan vähän enemmän. Women are still a very small minority in the poker room. And I think some of it is because uh, a lot of women want to have fun at the table. And sometimes it's not so fun. And if they have a bad experience, maybe they won't come back. And that bad experience is bound to happen at some time or another. A lot of times, I'd say like 10 years ago, um, if there was a woman at the table, a lot of the time men would hit on her during the event. Because I'd be like, why not? You know, this is like a social event. And I see that less. I mean, obviously, like, people are going to, you know, hit on people that they think are attractive. Like, that's life. But, you know, you got to see that poker is not a bar, right? It's a competition. And, you know, it's not a, a good context for, for that unless you have, like, some kind of strong signal that somebody is interested. So I, I just think that, you know, just like you have to be aware of what's going on at the table to make the most money at poker, if you want to be an ally and a feminist, you also have to do the work and pay attention. Try to be a good ambassador for poker and try to speak up and, and call the floor. And if you're too afraid to get involved, just walk over quietly and discreetly and tell the floor, look, would you please monitor the situation on the table, whatever it is, and, uh, and they will. Naisten turnaukset on vähän sellainen kaksipiippunen juttu, että toisaalta se on hyvä, että silloin on pienempi kynnys mennä pelaamaan niitä turnauksia, kun on pelkkiä naisia ympärillä, ei joudu siihen miesvaltaiseen pokeripöytään, mutta toisaalta se taas tuo sellaista vastakkainasettelua, että on erikseen oikeat turnaukset ja sitten on naisten turnaukset, että ne on pienemmällä vainilla ja tavallaan helpompi mennä ja yleensä ajatellaan myös, että siellä on huonompi taso että siellä on enemmän aloittelijoita ja naispelaajia pelkästään. Originally when I first started, I was against women's only tournaments because I thought, well, we don't need some. Our brains are as good as men's brains. It's not like it's a, a boxing match here. You know, you don't need physical strength. But then I came to realize that women need these women's only tournaments so they can get used to playing in a non-threatening atmosphere. I encourage women to, to try these women's only, but then once they get a feel for poker, go out and play in open events. And I, because I, I just know that I really liked the women's events just because they were less expensive and they were a way to make friends. And we had nothing to do with being like, oh, I'm not good enough to play with men. I never thought that. I, it was just that I, it gave me like kind of like a goal if I wanted to go to a series and I couldn't afford to play the main. I was like, well, I can go and play the women and play some of like the turbos at night. So yeah, I think there should be more women's tournaments just to allow women to meet each other and to perhaps, you know, give some special prizes. Like, I love the idea of having a women's tournament and maybe satelliting the winner to the main event so that you can just, like, push, push forward more women into the high-stakes events. I wish I, that women who were thinking about entering the game um, just understood that in order to keep playing poker, Um, they have to understand what they really love about it, what they're passionate about it, because wins and losses and good luck and bad luck will oscillate and you have no control over it. But if you can kind of understand that what you love about poker is the math, like that's what I love about poker, um, and the model for life, then that's incredible. For a lot of people, they love, they love the feeling of bluffing or calling a bluff, you know, either getting a bluff through or calling a bluff. And I think like just keeping that in your mind, what it was that made you want to start playing the game so that when you do have those moments of doubt and self-doubt, you can kind of like have that anchor about why you love poker. I, I, I think I, I want people to know that.
In 1992, I went on the first ever card player cruises trip, and it was so much fun. I went with my fiance, Scott Rogers, and another poker player, uh, Denny Axel, and all three of us were professional poker players. We had no aspirations to be anything but be professional poker players. But we had so much fun on that cruise that we thought, how can we get involved and never have to miss another cruise? And we went to the owners of the magazine, uh, who at the time were June and Phil Field, and we said, we, what can we do to, to be part of this? And they said, we're tired. Why don't you just buy the whole thing? Well, we were professional poker players and we knew nothing about uh, journalism or running a, a magazine, uh, but we said, of course we will. And we were like, oh, what are we going to do for the money? So we found a venture capitalist to loan us the money and uh, we worked for our sweat equity and it was interesting. Part of the deal was that the fields had to stay and train us because, as I said, we knew nothing about running a magazine. But uh, we had this attitude, fake it till you make it, and we pretended like we knew what we were doing. And by the end of the six months, we did know what we were doing. And uh, we got the magazine to, uh, from a 32-page black and white newsprint into a full glossy 132 pages when I sold it, a four-color, gorgeous magazine that advertisers wanted to be in. One of the reasons I wanted to do something besides just play poker is that you get a feeling that you're not contributing to society. You know, you're taking people's money. Uh, I was always nice to people, so I didn't like take their money and berate them, but there's this feeling that you need to give back. And so the magazine was a way to give back. And I wanted to thank the industry that I love so much by uh, making it, uh, making the magazine cover everything, all, all the different events, and hope to bring people into the field of poker uh, and to portray it in, in the wonderful light that poker really is. I think one of the biggest honors in my life was being elected into the Poker Hall of Fame in the year 2011. I never really thought that they would start putting women into the Poker Hall of Fame because it was all men who voted. I think the reason that I was chosen was because I campaigned so hard to clean up the abuse in poker rooms. I took a stand and uh, when I owned the Card Player magazine, I went to the people in charge of the World Series of Poker and I said, look, we have to do something about what's going on in the poker rooms. We have to clean up the behavior and make it nice for everyone to come in, not just women, but for everyone to come in. And that was the year that they, uh, they started the penalties for misbehaving. You know, I told them, I said, if I have to start writing about it, I'll start writing about it, but hopefully we can clean it up before I need to do that. So I had a little bit of leverage, and I think that's why I made it into the Poker Hall of Fame. Honor of a lifetime. I'm such a huge fan of Linda Johnson. She's stunned so much for winning the game. And what I really love about Linda is that from the very beginning, she was a trailblazer of thinking not just about women in a narrow way, like who's the best female poker player, but you know, she was all about, you know, stopping abuse at every level, you know, dealers, floor people, um, and we, you know, creating an environment where women feel welcome as staff, as dealers, as players. I think that's incredible. There is no room for abuse in poker. That's something that I think is going to really, really keep women away. And so that like zero tolerance policy is so beautiful to see. I think it's every poker player's dream to win a bracelet. It's like, you know, if you're a football player, you want to get that uh, Super Bowl ring. And, and so it was something that I always wanted. I had had several finishes, final table. I had come in fifth, fourth, third, and then now I'm playing for the bracelet. And it did mean so much to me to win it. That day was a very hard day for me because I was owner of Card Player Magazine and I had uh, a little tiff with one of our advertisers who wanted to uh, submit a picture that I didn't think was worthy of Card Player Magazine. It would be more worthy of Playboy. And so he was threatening me and I was quite upset when I went down to the horseshoe to play the final table. But when I walked in, there were hundreds of people that had signs that said, Go Linda, and hats that said, Go Linda.
And I, I knew I was going to win. When I think back to that day, it was one of the best days of my life. <laughs> <laughs>